Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, June 15th, 2024. And our top story today, the Fed holds interest rates steady. And joining me now to help break it all down, Jane King joins us from the NASDAQ. Jane, always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Great to be here again, Jeffrey. Yeah, it's been an interesting week to say the least. Um, let's start with the Fed, the Federal Reserve's uh, interest rate decision. What can you tell us and how did markets react? Yeah, well, no change at all, which was what everybody expected. Um, they did hint that there may be one interest rate cut this year. And most people at this point are looking to be September at the September meeting. So, um, you know, that puts us right in front of the election. So that'll be interesting to see uh, if that in fact has happened. But inflation, they acknowledge, has just been more stubborn than they expected. And uh, we saw, you know, we got a couple of inflation reports out this week and they came in a little less than expected, but inflation is cumulative and it keeps going up. So car insurance of 20 percent, housing was up as well, medical care. So, you know, when you look at that basket of goods that they measure, there's still some things uh, that are going up in price. So that's just making it hard for the Fed to make any downward move in interest rates right now. And how did the how did markets react, Jane? I mean, I, I, I guess the, the tea leaves are out there. They've read the uh, the dot plots, right, all that kind of information. And I guess they know that there's going to be one interest rate cut, but but how did they react to Jerome Powell's comments? Uh, well, they soared. I mean, we saw at least two, maybe three record highs this week in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Um, the Dow's kind of lagging behind a little bit, um, but, you know, which kind of surprised me because I didn't feel like the number came in that much under expectations. And, you know, so we get one rate cut versus six, which is what we thought, you know, a year or so ago. Um, but the markets reacted positively and markets do what they want to do. And they were very strong this week. Jane, uh, uh, not to um, get ahead of the, put the cart before the horse, but you had a very interesting interview that you're going to be putting out, I guess, uh, the following week, next week. Uh, with Jim Bullard, who I think is now the dean or the head of uh, Purdue University. He's a former Fed governor. What what yes. can you share? Can you give us a little bit of a tease? I mean, I don't want to I don't want to get ahead of you, but can you give us a little bit of tease what he may have said about the interest rates? Yeah. So he's now uh, he was the St. Louis Fed governor and now he's the head of the Mitch Daniels School of Business at Purdue. Um, and we talked about interest rate cuts and he's, you know, it was interesting. The most interesting thing he said was he didn't think the Fed would be impacted at all by the election. That wasn't going to be a factor. They were just going to look at the data and make the monetary policies based on that data. So um, there's, a, I'm sure, a lot of pressure going to be on them as we get closer to the election. But he believes that they'll be able to ignore that and just focus on data and what they need to do. I always thought the Fed was supposed to be independent of the government, supposed right? Be, isn't that, isn't that what be. the 1913 was the founding yeah. of the Federal Reserve? I'm I mean, not you know, they should be. And, you know, the Supreme Court should be, but everything is political these days. And, you know, despite, I'm sure that they get, you know, they'll get some pressure uh, to do things. I mean, people are going to try. People are going to try to, you know, they're going to write a letter to Jerome Powell or something to try to get them to do what they want to do. So hopefully he just focuses on the data and does what the economy, the economy needs. Jane, when you look ahead towards uh, next week, the week of the seventeenth, June seventeenth, it's a Monday. Uh, what what are you looking for? I guess as you as you look at futures, as you look at some of the maybe the Asian markets, some of the other markets around the world, or is there anything that you're looking for next week that in terms of reporting data and how it's going to relate to broader stock market? Well, it is a holiday shortened week, so the markets will be closed on Juneteenth uh, for the Juneteenth holiday. So. It's right in the middle of the week, so we'll see what kind of impact that has. Um, but yeah, I feel like we're start, okay. So we've got the Fed meeting out of the way, the inflation report yeah. out of the way. I almost get the feeling we're starting to look a little bit at technicals and then also internationally. So when I feel like international is in the market a little bit, France, um, things may change there politically. The Bank of Japan has been, um, you know, cutting interest rates, making some changes there. So. I feel like we're going to have a shift to looking more internationally and what's going to happen, as well as some some technicals. There's some talk that we're oversold. I mean, it's, you know, as great as AI is, um, maybe it's getting ahead of itself a little bit. So we'll see if that proves to be true or not. But it certainly had a good run this year. And, and Jane, not that we don't talk about politics in the program, but there was a sea change in the European Union and some of the countries in terms of the uh, 
the, the I guess the I'll say the parliament or the legis they're all yeah. different. They're not right. generally unicameral, but there's been a sea change there. Any thoughts about how that could impact? Because as, as we talked about, politics somehow always bleeds its way into yeah. markets. Well, it's a huge week or a huge year for politics. We had the the uh, elections in Europe, uh, India, Modi uh, was elected by a smaller margin than what was expected. And India has been a very good performing stock market so far this year. Of course, we've got our elections that are coming up, which are going to be heating up. Um, but definitely a conservative tilt uh, to what we saw in Europe. Um, probably the most it's been in a long time. And there's thinking about, well, is there similar sentiment here in the U.S.? And will we see a conservative wave here as well? We've Set of red, a red wave a couple of years ago didn't happen, so who knows? Um, but it's very interesting times, that's for sure. Jane, you ever been polled? I have never in my no. 52 years been polled. I by do anybody. get some calls. Well, I do get calls from um, some, I have gotten maybe a couple, um, and maybe not even about like the presidential election, but more like local things in New York yeah. schools and stuff like that. Um, a lot of calls from politicians, but yeah, I mean, it's funny because like you hear about all these polls and, you know, who, yeah. are, they who are they talking to? Because I know they're not talking to me and I talk to my family. I mean, yeah. they don't, they don't get phone calls. So I'm just well, wondering. You live they, in a kind of a swing query. State. You live in a swing state, kind of like nobody's going to uh, pull me about is, the okay. presidential election because they know New York's probably going to go Democrat. But I think that, I think people who live in, you know, North Carolina and Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. Michigan and things like that might get pulled more. I just wonder, like, not to go down a rabbit hole, but I'm just wondering, like, I took statistics in college. Uh, I'm not sure how I did on that, but I'll have to go back and look at my report card. But yeah. but the sample sizes, yeah. 330 million people in the United States, give or take. Mm -hmm. How how can, I, and I'm, we're going way off the rabbit, uh, the trail here, but how can that be re representative of what the broader nation is feeling it just well, yeah make and if they're only talking to like a thousand people and polling is harder now than it used to be people don't answer their phones people are you know they're on you know mobile devices some young people don't even have phones so i'm not sure how the i mean i'm talking landline phones landlines yeah we know uh, yeah. they have we know they have phones i keep on running into yeah, that's them right yeah, no i'm well aware of that i got two teenagers but um you know it just, it just feels like it's not been as accurate over the past, let's say, you know, three or four presidential cycles than what we used to see, like in the 80s, used to be pretty accurate, but uh, not so much anymore. Yeah, well, we'll have to see how that plays out. But what, Jane, we always appreciate your analysis when it comes to markets. We try to leave the politics out of it. We just like to have some fun from time to time. Jane King, always great to see you. Thanks. We look forward to having you back on the program again next week. Thanks, Jane. Always great to see you. Thanks for your excellent analysis. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. I want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Welcome back. It was another great week of shows with great topics and of course, great guests. We kicked off the week with a look at how caregivers can now get deliveries or rides. Let's take a look. Yeah, there's no question. I think when we think about uh, that burden, it's only going to increase based on the demography in this country, as well as um, kind of the roles that caregivers continue to have to undertake. I think oftentimes that number could be even um, underreported when you think about the physical, emotional, mental strain, as well as the kind of requirements it takes to take care of a loved one. Uh, and I think anybody within the sandwich generation and others feels that every day, certainly. So um, yeah, one in uh, one in Five, but I think it's probably really more than that when you really think about what's actually happening outside the four walls of a clinic today. The reports that that we see indicate that about seven thousand dollars of out of pocket expense um, on a, on a per caregiver basis, uh, and nearly forty percent of the caregivers respond that they never feel truly relaxed or comfortable uh, given the kind of stresses they feel both within. 
um, within the four walls of their home and, and whatever they're doing uh, to support their loved ones outside of that, outside of their community or outside where they are. So I think um, there's no question that uh, that stress continues to kind of drive a wedge between kind of someone's aggregate quality of life and the financial strain is very real. Again, $7,000 of out-of-pocket expense that's going towards a loved one and not towards someone's individual kind of needs or their family's needs is, is a pretty significant uh, amount of money. Yeah, so Uber Health was founded around seven years ago, really predicated on the idea that providers in the community needed ways to get uh, their patients to their clinics. And so we started off doing work, uh, both not-for-profit work, a lot of actually bringing vaccines and other kinds of services into the community, uh, but really focused first in health systems, hospitals, uh, and the provider settings, specifically thinking about dialysis, um, and substance abuse and other care settings where there were uh, challenges to the frequency of a visit and also kind of a repetitive kind of motion as you think about um, the kind of care that needs to be delivered in that outpatient setting. Um, so fast forward seven years from now, today we're kind of an integrated platform across uh, the healthcare ecosystem. We're integrated across the payer landscape as well as providers. And we're really focused on developing an infrastructure that allows ancillary benefits to be accessed in ways that we believe um, is really meaningful both to the patient and to the broader ecosystem. So um, that takes the form of transportation today. It also takes the form of, not, of over the counter medications and even grocery delivery. Uh, and so think of us as an, as a platform that you're able to, in a delegated way and, and on behalf of somebody else, get somebody where they need to be or get the things they need specifically related to kind of the improvement of their health. And we focus there on OTC and grocery benefits. We were so thrilled to announce our caregiver solution here just a few weeks ago. Um, and it, caregiving is, is a different discipline for us in the sense it's our first kind of entry into the being able to solve directly for the member or for the patient uh, directly through their consumer application. So what we talked about previously, Uber Health as a platform was really focused on those that are delivering care within the four walls of a clinic or inside of a pair. Caregiver allows the care receiver to invite that loved one into their experience directly on their Uber application. And we believe that's transformative largely because so much of that care can be delivered outside the four walls. And, and it's really an empowerment function for the way that that care receiver can then kind of share that burden with that caregiver and vice versa. So in a very material way, if I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and my caregiver is in Houston, Texas, that that loved one is in Houston, Texas, that, that individual can now order a ride on behalf of me and tap into my benefits over time and do it in a way that both the care that loved one and that caregiver has access to that information in real time, just like the magic of Uber today. And then I think additionally, uh, it allows for that same kind of integration and communication that you, we've grown accustomed to. So three-way communication with the driver, immediate updates when that loved one or mom has gotten to where they need to be, um, or in the same way that we think about deliveries, um, as that individual, that courier in our marketplace goes out and supports that individual with their order, we're getting that in real time, both the, the care receiver and the caregiver themselves. So we think it's really transformative to reduce that administrative and painful friction. And it allows a, a caregiver to care for somebody when they're not proximal to that patient, which many of us are given kind of the spread of our families and kind of the way that we think about um, where we live today, which is not necessarily, as I think many of us know, uh, within the same communities we grew up in or where our loved ones are. And we also discussed implementing artificial intelligence AI in the retirement industry. Let's take a look. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of different, different ways of looking at it from our perspective. And when you look at operational work, we're really talking about using technology to replicate cognitive tasks that people are doing. So, so we've been in the, the business of automation for the last 10 to 15 years. And, and a lot of the tasks that we automate are, you know, repetitive rules-based tasks. And where we've layered in AI on top of that now is really about the cognitive tasks, making decisions, judgment calls, things that might previously be thought of things you can't automate because it requires human judgment. We're really using using technology, using data to help um, with those types of activities now that that just means we can we can automate a lot more activity in our business. Yeah, in the record keeping business for the retirement services team, there's a lot of repetitive tasks that go on. And when you think about, you know, just, you know, as you begin the relationship with a client, it's that onboarding and it's adding in all the plans and 
all of the plan rules and taking into consideration all of the different facets of the business, it's taking something from a piece of paper or taking something from a form and adding that or loading that into the technology that's going to drive the outcomes for the business. So we really are taking a look at all of the functions that we perform in the business and saying, what are those things that are repetitive in nature? What are those tasks that we can look at automating something from point A to point B? And then really looking at those things that fall out of that type of process. And those are the things that we want to focus our talent and our resources and our people on, right? Because that's really where the value add comes in. That's where we're able to be consultative to our clients. That's where we're able to be consultative to our participants that we're servicing and also sponsors, TPAs, advisors, and all of the other contingents that we support. Um, so we've really been very focused on identifying all of those functions that we do that are repetitive in nature and looking at how do we deploy technology to help to facilitate all of that. Oh, yeah, look, it's, I mean, it, it, it's everywhere in, 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 in every facet of every business right now. But there's a couple of different things that that certainly in the financial services industry, if I just take that from our perspective, the broad financial services industry, you know, we've been using AI models, machine learning in particular, over the last 10, 10 years in, in areas where we're trying to um, find a more effective way of getting answers, you know, or, dis or making decisions. So things like anti-money laundering, compliance related activities where you're really dealing with, you know, large quantities of data um, and you're, you're trying to identify patterns and you're trying to make decisions. And, and, and in the past, the decisions were made by lots of people looking at screens and comparing data and trying to make a judgment call on it. Whereas there's a much more efficient way of doing that by, by using AI models to do that. Where um, I think it's quite interesting in the last probably 12 months, um, large language models and Gen AI have come to the fore as a, in the consumer consciousness. Um, and what we're finding it like Gen AI in particular is really useful for is around documentation, document um, understanding. So if you think about it, just to give you a very simple example, every industry, every business you know of deals in documents of some form, whether they're digitized or unstructured or forms or PDFs or whatever. And in the past, we used to use, like, or we still do use a lot of OCR technologies to try and extract data from that and then sort of use it downstream in, 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 in rules-based activities. But actually, if you think about it, in general, when you're looking at a document, and we have a person looking at a document, we're trying to get an answer out of that document. We're trying to say, is this certificate valid? Does this form of identity confirm the individual? You know, so actually, I don't care about 90% of the content of the document. I care about the analysis of the answer that I need to do by looking at the document. So we're finding Gen AI in particular is really good at that, generating an answer based on a, a full document that it gets. So... Here's just just two examples. I mean, you've got large scale data problems um, uh, and you're identifying patterns and so on. And then you've got this kind of particular challenge around documents. But every aspect of our business, where you where you where you start to look at it is where in the past you felt you needed lots of people to make those decisions and move it forward. And now there's you know, there's the technology is advancing all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, just constantly seeing new use cases appear. Absolutely not, right? What we're giving our employees is a more efficient way to work. And I think that's a really important way that we need to be thinking about the business. So when we think about how we've deployed it in, in my particular sphere within SSNC, um, what we've done in, in, our, in our area of work in the last year, we've rolled out approximately 65 digital workers. Um, our goal and objective is to double that this year. Um, and we have a whole list of initiatives and processes that we've identified that are prime for really looking at pieces and parts to be, you know, ingested by dig a digital worker. Our employees have had a lot of fun with it. Um, we've named our digital workers. We even talk about, well, the digital workers might be, you know, a little slow today. We need to regen them or restart them. So they've had a lot of fun with it in addition to really being proactive and identifying things that are repetitive in nature that quite frankly are 
difficult tasks because you have to be very, very focused on quality. Like if you transpose a number or if there are things that you, you know, don't necessarily uh, put in the right spot or, you know, there's different problems that are associated with it. So what our employees are really able to do is allow the digital worker to ingest that item, those items into the system. And then they're really looking at those things that fall out. And that's a really value add, right? Those are value add activities that allow them to grow and stretch and mature in their roles. Then some of these repetitive tasks that there's a much better way to, you know, ingest them into our system. One of the areas that we were, we very heavily digitized is payroll. Right. So payroll in the retirement industry starts the whole process. Right. That's how you're getting the money in. That's how you're then investing those assets into the retirement plans. So we're able to use a digital worker to take those files that are coming in from our clients and match those off against rosters that exist. So instead of our employees looking at taking a payroll file and putting it into the system, it's all automatically ingested. So then they're just dealing with the exceptions that fall out of it. Again, much more value-added activity than just the repetitive task that they would end up doing day in and day out. Well, can I just, just uh, go ahead, Brian. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I was just going to add it. It's a good, it's always an interesting question, you know, I mean, and I think the, um, in, in terms of people's jobs, I mean, I think if you look back in history, I mean, I just go back through my, my period of career, every new technology that comes forward, people are like, oh, it's going to change. It's going to take my jobs away. In fact, it does the opposite. It creates new jobs. And the analogy I always I always use in this example is if I take something like marketing and I go back maybe 20 years or 30 years and it was primarily print-based, probably only even 20 years, primarily print-based. And it's now almost entirely a digital business. Has the number of people involved in marketing reduced or increased? Probably it has been an explosion in marketing activity, but it's all digital media-based um, activity. So, what, what that means, I think, though, interestingly for people is if you're in the world of marketing today and you, do, you don't understand digital marketing, you're probably not in business. And I think that's the change that you see happening in other parts of the industry. So if you're in operations or you're in accounting or whatever, and you don't know how to use technology, digital workers, automation, AI to get your work done, you become less relevant. So, you know, the other way around, I think, to think about it is people who know how to use AI will probably get ahead of people that don't. And then that's the critical change that you see happening. And it's one of the things that we're trying to do is get more and more people within our organization to understand AI, to know how to leverage it, to know when to use it, to know how to access it, et cetera. And, and well, if well, I could just kind of add one more piece to that, um, we're changing the way people are working. We're giving them new skill sets. And we're making, you know, we're making their jobs more exciting. And I think that the organization has embraced it and they've been really excited to, you know, understand how it works and how it can be applied to what they're doing day in and day out. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, something you think we should talk to? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Well, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN Sunday. David Levine and Kevin Walsh Groom Law Group will be here, as will Oliver Rennick of the Schwab Network. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving. Don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.